Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the service. It's lovely to see you. Just realized I'm kind of blending in a bit with the background um, with my jumper this evening. Um, and I must confess, I am a bit anxious because actually you're all up here and I'm down, down, down here a wee, a wee bit. Um, I'm a bit anxious because Danny's down there on the sign desk and he's got, he's just, He's just laughing at me, so I'm not sure what he's going to do. But it's lovely to be here with you. Um, thank you for coming. We, we are, are here, here to worship God, and let's do that as we sing Abba Father, and we'll sing this twice. Join with me as we pray together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can call you Abba. And Father, it is our desire that um, we will follow your will in our lives. And Father, we come to you this evening and we confess that it's easy to say, but difficult to put into practice. And Father, throughout history, your people have been called to follow you and to obey you, and yet they have constantly strayed from you and struggled with that issue of faithfulness and obedience to your, to your will and to your way. And we confess this evening, Father, that we are no different. But Father, we come knowing that you love us, that you care for us, that your, your heart towards us is of love and compassion and kindness and justice and as we look at some of these words in our sermon later in our service Lord we thank you that they reveal to us your heart and so Father we come to worship we come to thank you for all that you have done for us through your son the Lord Jesus we thank you for all that he means to us for all that we have in him. And Father, we worship you and we adore you. We come to lift our hearts in praise and adoration. And as we come together, Lord, we pray that you will meet with us, that you will really presence yourself with us in an intimate way, in a real way, Lord. May we know your presence. And everything that we say and do and sing and pray, may it be pleasing to you and acceptable to you. And as we leave, Father, may we leave determined to live for you and to serve you in the days ahead. It's in our Saviour's name we ask these things. Amen. 
We're going to sing again, All I Once Held Dear. Let's stand and sing together. Our reading this evening is Jer- Jeremiah chapter 9. If you have a Bible with you, do turn to it and then do keep it open at the chapter for later on. Jeremiah chapter 9, we're going to read from verse 1 through to verse 20, end of verse 24. And we're coming into the middle of an exchange um, between Jeremiah and the Lord. So at times it's the Lord that says something. At other times, it's the voice of Jeremiah um, that that we hear. And it's really a pronouncement about why God is judging his people for um, their their unfaithfulness. Oh, that my head were a spring of water, verse 1, and my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert a lodging place for travellers, so that I might leave my people and go away from them. For they are all adulterers, a crowd of unfaithful people. They make ready their tongue like a bow to shoot lies. It is not by truth that they triumph in the land. They go from one sin to another. They do not acknowledge me, declares the Lord. Beware of your friends, do not trust anyone in your clan, for every one of them is a deceiver, and every friend a slanderer. Friend deceives friend, and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongues to lie, they weary themselves with sinning. You live in the midst of deception, in their deceit they refuse to acknowledge me, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says, see, I will refine and test them for what else can I do because of the sin of my people. Their tongue is a deadly arrow. It speaks deceitfully. 
With their mouths they speak all cordially to their neighbours, but in their hearts they set traps for them. Should I not punish them for this, declares the Lord? Should I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? I will weep and wail for the mountains and take a lament concerning the wilderness grasslands. They are desolate and untraveled, and the lowing of cattle is not heard. The birds have all fled and the animals are gone. I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a hunt of jackals, and I will lay waste the towns of Judah. No one can live there. Who is wise enough to understand this? Who has been instructed by the Lord and can explain it? Why has the land been ruined and laid waste like a desert that no one can cross? The Lord said, it is because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them. They have not obeyed me or followed my law. Instead, they have followed the stubbornness of their hearts. They have followed the Baals as their ancestors taught them. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, see, I will make this people eat bitter food and drink poisoned water. I will scatter them among the nations that neither they nor their ancestors have known, and I will pursue them with the sword until I have made an end of them. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Consider now, call for the wailing women to come, send for the most skillful of them. Let them come quickly and wail over us till our eyes overflow with tears and water streams from our eyelids. The sound of wailing is heard from Zion. How ruined are we? How great is our shame? We must leave our land because our houses are in ruins. Now you women, hear the word of the Lord. Open the, your ears to the words of his mouth. Teach your daughters how to wail. Teach one another a lament. Death has climbed in through our windows and has entered our fortresses. It has removed the children from the streets and the young men from the public squares. Say, this is what the Lord declares. Dead bodies will lie like dung on the open field, like cut grain behind the reaper, with no one to gather them. This is what the Lord says, let not the wise boast in their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. And this is God's word to us this evening. Just as I was reading there, it, it struck me about um, how people in the land of Syria um, might read words like that, um, given their experience of the total destruction of their land. Um, the idea of children being taken from the streets, of men from the public squares, when you see the desolation in cities completely destroyed, um, how poignant those words must be for those people. But we do come to a God of history. And I want to lead us in our prayer of intercession um, and to focus on the fact that God is a God of history as well as a God of our future. Um, so our God is still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And throughout the prayer, there's a, there's a small phrase that I'd like us to repeat together. I say, great is your name and greatly to be praised. So if you're comfortable doing that, join with me when I say that. Great is your name and greatly to be praised. Join with me as we pray. Almighty God, creator and ruler of the universe. We praise you for your great love, your faithful guidance, and your sovereign purpose. Great is your name, and greatly to be praised. We praise you that throughout history and throughout our lives, you have been at work, 
bringing good out of evil, hope out of despair, love out of hate, and life out of death. Great is your name, and greatly to be praised. We praise you for the way you have changed lives across the centuries. Your call to Abraham to set out in search of a new land, of Moses to lead your people out of Egypt, of judges and prophets to speak your word, of disciples to follow Jesus, and of leaders and teachers to build your church. Great is your name and greatly to be praised. We praise you that even when your people have gone astray, you have been there looking to lead them back to you striving to restore the broken relationship, to put the past behind them and help them start again. <clears throat> Though time and again your love has been betrayed, always you have remained faithful. Great is your name and greatly to be praised. We praise you that with us too, you have been patient, always willing to forgive slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, your nature always to show mercy. When we have lost our way, when we have lost sight of your goodness, even when we have lost our faith, still you have stayed true, seeking to draw us back to yourself. Great is your name and greatly to be praised. Almighty God, Lord of human history, Lord of our history. We come to you with gladness, with praise in our hearts and thanksgiving on our lips. Renew us now through your gracious presence. Assure us of your forgiveness and equip us to serve you as you deserve. For great is your name and greatly to be praised. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. We'll sing again this time, Jesus, all for Jesus.
Thank you, Brian. Um, this evening, um, we return to um, our series on selected passages from the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. Um, by way of quick reminder, um, Jeremiah lived in a ter- time of turmoil as Judah engaged in a game of political football between the two power nations of Egypt and Babylon. Always under the control of Babylon, Judah repeatedly turned to Egypt in her attempts to throw off the Babylonian yoke and gain a measure of independence. However, these alliances with Egypt always ultimately failed and eventually resulted in the the fall of Jerusalem and then complete exile of the people of Judah to Babylon. Now, Jeremiah was given the unenviable task of standing in opposition to the royal house of of David. At this time, um, kings from the line of David were still on the throne in Judah. The prophets, the priests, and also the people by announcing the destruction of Jerusalem and urging people to accept exile in Babylon if they wish to have any future at all. The key issue in Jeremiah isn't simply the the people's unfaithfulness to God because of their idolatry, but their attempts to justify worshipping and serving Baal, a false god, alongside worshipping the true God. They refuse to accept Jeremiah's message because they refuse to accept that being unfaithful to God by this double standard of seeking to serve God and Baal at the same time. They fail to recognize that their continued future as the people of God is in real danger. So the book of Jeremiah shows us how God is God alone and a jealous God who can't tolerate idolatry. Yet it also shows us how God is also compassionate and loving towards his people. So while Judah's unfaithfulness will end in its destruction, in keeping with the promises made in Deuteronomy, you know, the blessings and the woes, if you do this, then this will happen. God has a bright future for his people, if only they will listen to Jeremiah and turn again to him. God desires to bring to his people a time of restoration and a new covenant. And in Jeremiah, we see the desire of God's own heart for his people revealed through the heart of Jeremiah, the man who weeps and expresses his own anguish at the people's disobedience. And this presents us with two immediate points of challenge. First, the people of Judah from the top down, the the house of David, the king, the political and religious leaders, right through to the man and woman on the street, believed it was possible to give themselves to worshipping and serving Baal, a false god, and at the same time be faithful to God, the Lord God, who alone is God. And we can read about this today and wonder, how could they um, believe what to us is so obviously wrong? And yet what the people of Judah were trying to do was simply following what all the nations around them did. It was the done thing to embrace other gods rather than give yourself exclusively to worshipping and serving only one god. It was like hedging your bets. If one god fails, the other one might come through for you. And this is the repeated failing of God's people throughout the entire Old Testament. Time and time again, they fail to give themselves exclusively to serving and worshipping the Lord God. And while we today, um, you know, in our sophisticated world, we don't worship Baal or other idols as gods, um, we can nevertheless hold back from giving ourselves fully in worship and service to God. We can make other things in life, idols, that keep us from being fully devoted to God. Our idols today may be more sophisticated and perhaps even have the appearance of being honorable. 
but anything that keeps us from being fully, fully devoted and faithful to God is still an idol. But secondly, in Jeremiah himself, the man, the person, we see the heart of God revealed. There are times throughout the book when it's actually quite difficult to, to separate out when God's speaking and when Jeremiah is speaking. And in our passage this evening, there are points um, when this is the case. We started right in the middle of one of those passages that scholars debate who is actually speaking. But this isn't really a problem in terms of our overall understanding of Jeremiah. Because when Jeremiah the man speaks... He does so in a way that reveals the heart of God for his chosen people, Judah. He speaks into the context in which Judah, as a people, find themselves. So he speaks truthfully of God's disapproval of their way of life, but also with ultimate hope for their restoration. And the challenge to us is clear, isn't it? We too, like Jeremiah must reflect the heart of God for the people here in Sydney, where he, God has called us to serve him. And this means we must be prepared to speak truthfully into the community about what's wrong with how people live and behave when they leave God out of their lives. But we must also make sure that like Jeremiah, we too show the heart of God for the people of Sydney. The God Jeremiah served is the same God we serve and his heart is still filled with love and compassion for those if only who will come to him in faith. And this speaking into the context, the true context of the community is important because as we turn now to Luke at chapter nine, we discover how God sees a broken society. Look with me at the picture God paints of society as his people turn away from him. In verse 3, he describes how people lie to one another. They use their, their tongues, their speech as a, as a weapon, a bow shooting lies and going from one sin to another. They fail to acknowledge me, says God. In verses 4 to 6, God warns them to be careful of friends and even family. No one can be trusted. They deceive one another. And in their deception, says God, they refuse to acknowledge me. And notice in verse 8 how they speak kindly to their neighbor's face, but then proceed to destroy the person's reputation in their conversations with others. So God says he will refine and test them. Now, the idea of refining and testing is that of purifying by the heat of burning coals in order to separate and burn away impurities. And God's very clear why he must do this in verse 13, which is the central verse of the entire chapter. It is because, says the Lord in verse 13, they have forsaken my law, which I set before them. They have not obeyed me or my law. Instead, verse 14, they have followed the stubbornness of their hearts. They have followed the Baals as their ancestors taught them. And so we discover how the Lord who provided manna from heaven and water from a rock while his people wandered in the wilderness before possessing the land, will now make his people eat bitter food and drink poisoned water, verse 15. Having gathered them together in the land of promise, he'll now scatter them throughout the nations, verse 16. So in a, in a great reversal of God's calling people together and giving them possession of the land promised to Abraham, we have his warning and portrayal throughout the rest of the chapter of desolations and destruction as God brings his punishment on his people. 
In fact, so great is the desolation that even the dead aren't buried but lie like dung on the open field. And the key point being made in these verses, which we mustn't miss, is that there's a clear connection between serving and obeying God and our relationships with others. When God is exchanged for other false gods and his way for us to live is ignored, his law, as our passage puts it, his way for us to live, the whole framework on which true covenant communities built falls down and no one can be trusted. And I want to take time just to highlight one further point from these verses because I want us to actually look in more detail specifically at the verses that speak of boasting. But look with me again at verse 14. The Lord God is speaking to Jeremiah and explaining why this great desolation and ruin of the land, which is described like a desert that no one can cross, is to take place. And he says, they, that is the people, have followed their hearts. They have followed the Baals. And then notice what he adds, as their ancestors taught them. Now, it strikes me that the point being made here isn't seeking in in some way to justify the failure of this generation of God's people because of the failure of past generations. Rather, the point highlights for us the importance each current generation of God's people has to leave a legacy of faithfulness and obedience to God that will inspire, encourage, and instruct future generations. Notice where the heart of their failure lies. God tells Jeremiah that the people have followed their hearts and allowed other gods in the place that only he should occupy in their lives. So we have two aspects highlighted here. The pursuit of self-interest, their hearts, and devotion to other things. In this case, the worship of Baal, a, a false God, which takes the place of God. And the warning to us is very clear. You see, we also set a pattern, a tone, a way of following the Lord that influences those who come after us. So the important thing we can do, for most important thing we can do for future generations is leave a legacy, an example of faithful service and obedience and full devotion to the Lord. Now, perhaps you're listening to me and you're thinking, I can't do much by way of practical service. Perhaps it's your health or other factors that limit your availability, and legitimately so. But we can and we do set an example to others in how we relate to each other, how we speak to each other and speak about each other by how committed we are to supporting and encouraging others in their journey of faith, we set an example to others. May people see in each one of us a devotion to God and a heart that seeks the good of others over that of self. Let's make every effort to invest in the next generation for the Lord and how we teach them by our example today and may they see in us that when it when it comes to boasting it's not what but who you boast in that matters most because as we see in verse 23 the people of judah were boasting in the wrong things now the word boasting is used to describe the behavior of god's people who of a person who wants to give themselves errors and graces to become somebody. It's a way of making sure others are aware of your status. It's a look at me, see how important I am type of behavior. In other words, it's all about promotion of self and self-worth. And this self-promotion is reflected in the focus of the wrongful boasting we read about in verse 23. 
Let not the wise boast in their wisdom, says the Lord. Now, throughout the Bible, wisdom is a good thing, which is to be sought and highly prized. And many of us will be familiar with key phrases and verses that speak of wisdom. For example, Job tells us that to God belong wisdom and power, counsel and understanding are his. While the psalmist writes, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And in the Bible, we have this idea of discovering or finding wisdom so that we might become the complete, the genuine human beings that we're meant to be. So we read in Genesis chapter 3 how when Eve sees the fruit of the tree and sees that it's pleasing to the eye and good for food and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she takes some and eats it and then gives some to Adam. And in our passage, the Lord says that those who consider themselves truly wise aren't to boast in their wisdom because, of course, true wisdom belongs to the Lord. But also, the strong aren't to boast in their strength, and the rich aren't to boast in their riches. Now, strength and riches are another way of expressing power and influence in society. It's the powerful and wealthy who have significant positions in the decision-making bodies of the land, the, the government and courts, the religious establishments. While it's the weak and the poor who lack real influence, have limited or no access to justice, and who are often excluded from worship. And we see this not only in our society, but we see it, don't we, throughout the world that's brought to our television screens through our news. Those with the greatest wealth are often the people with the greatest influence within governments and the justice systems of many countries in our world today. And our passage and many others we could turn to reveal to us how the Lord takes no delight in these things. But instead, the gospel accounts portray us a Jesus who deliberately seeks out the poor and needy, the outcast, the marginalized, and welcomes them into his kingdom. So if God doesn't delight in boasting that promotes power and riches, what type of boasting does he delight in? Well, look with me at verse 24. Let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. The word translated know it in our Bible in that phrase, understanding to know me, occurs throughout Jeremiah chapters 8 and 9. And in chapter 8, we read of birds who know the time of their migration and of people who do not know the requirements of the Lord. And the meaning behind this word know or acknowledge, as it sometimes occurs, um, has this sense of living in a relationship with God. It's not that people don't know anything about God, but that their relationship with him doesn't influence their daily behavior, their way of life. And the key point for us is that to know or acknowledge the Lord means to live in a relationship with him by following his commands. And when we do this, then our lives will be characterized by righteousness, honesty, upright behavior. And in this, Jeremiah tells us, the Lord delights. So let's quickly look at the virtues or character behaviors described in verse 24, which belong to God and should also belong also to those who follow him. First, I am the Lord who exercises kindness. 
Now, the Hebrew word translated in the NIV as kindness is hesed. And there's no one word in English which fully conveys its meaning. A better translation, perhaps, is steadfast love. It's the idea of covenant loyalty, faithfulness, kindness, goodness, mercy, and compassion, all wrapped together in one word. And Hesed is based on a relationship. It has this sense of a deep and abiding loyalty and commitment between two parties. Hesed is fundamentally an action. It recognizes and acts to relieve an urgent essential need. It's usually deliverance from dire straits. So Hesed is performed by someone in a, to someone in a weaker position by someone in a stronger position. And this is most clearly illustrated for us in God's acts of hesed for his people. So, for example, the redemption of the Israelites from Egypt demonstrates God's hesed. God hears the cries um, of his people and comes down to rescue them. The book of Ruth is a lovely book that is all about hesed, between the characters reflecting God's hesed for his people. But hesed is also a voluntary act it's a, of extraordinary mercy and generosity. It's a going beyond the call of duty. And throughout the Bible, we have this idea that as God demonstrates his hesed, his steadfast, his covenant love and faithfulness towards us. So we in turn are called upon to demonstrate our hesed, our love and faithfulness to God and one another. You see, we live in relationship to God, yes. But we also live in relationship with each other. And at the root of our relationships with God and each other, there must be hesed. In this, the Lord delights. It's hesed that causes us to act with love, loyalty, and compassion. It's hesed that provides the bases and proper motives for our actions. And in the context of our passage this evening, it's hesed that helps us see the world differently because it's selfless and not dominated by self-interest. The wrong kind of boasting. Instead, Hesed enables us as the people of God to reveal God to others by lives which are marked with love, loyalty, faithfulness, kindness, mercy, and compassion towards others. And when we practice this kind of Hesed, then we too will exercise justice and righteousness on earth in a way that delights the Lord. Now, we typically understand righteousness in terms of individual holiness. But like Hesed, righteousness too is a relational word. It suggests doing the right thing in relation to others, in relation to God and to the community. And the linking of justice and righteousness with Hesed suggests the faithful exercise of power, and influence in the community. People with power and influence control resources, but they must make sure that ordinary people can share in resources such as land and food. People with power and influence control decision-making in the courts and in government, and in Jeremiah's day, they sat at the city gate and dispensed their judgment. But they must make decisions in a fair way, making sure justice is available to everyone. People with power and control and influence control what happens in community worship, the worship life of the community. But they must make sure that it's offered in a way that's inclusive and faithful to the Lord. 
And when we truly live in relationship with the Lord God, then like God, we will seek to exercise steadfast love, hesed, justice and righteousness in relationships with one another in the community in which God has placed us. And as we do so, we can be assured that in these things, the Lord delights. How do we know that this is true for us? Well, turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where from verse 26 we read these words. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him, God, that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul here reminds the believers in Corinth that they don't need to seek status and power by putting on errors about themselves in order to be somebodies. You see, exploring what it means to be in Christ so that what is true of him is true of us as believers is, basic, is the believer's basic strength and delight and joy. This is how we find our true identity and status. God has vindicated Jesus in his resurrection. God has set him apart for his own service. God has accomplished in him the defeat of the great enslaving power of sin and death. And, writes Paul, if you are in Christ, a member of his family, then this wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption are yours too. And if that doesn't make you a somebody, nothing will. Because we are in Christ. We don't need to boast about ourselves. For we can boast in the Lord. And in this, our Heavenly Father delights. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in Christ we find everything that we need. Father, we don't need to boast about our status, about the things that we do in life, because we find everything that we need in Christ. And Father, help us to live lives that are focused on you, devoted to you, in obedience and service. May Christ be our all in all, and may we find our true identity in him alone. And it's, his, it's in his beautiful name that we pray. Amen. We worship God with our offering.
As usual, don't rush away. There is tea and coffee after the service. Do stay and have a chat with each other. And why not talk about what it means to be in Christ? We sing our closing hymn, There is a Hope. Let's stand and sing together. Go now, not to serve yourself, but to serve others, not to seek your glory, but the glory of God the Father. And so may all you are and do make him known through Jesus Christ our Lord. And God's people said, Amen.